Hello and welcome to this time of worship with Gorgie Del Rai Stenhouse Church. While our minister Peter Barber is on sick leave, our local minister Moira Taylor Wintersgill will lead our worship. Moira's Lenten reflections continue at 10am on Facebook each weekday morning. And if you've any pastoral concerns, Moira's available during a vestry hour at 12 noon on Wednesdays, or you can reach her by phone on 07576 892 594. Please remember too, you can join our Zoom coffee time at 12 noon on Sundays to chat and catch up with friends. We have Zoom Yard evening services at 7pm on Sunday the 21st and 28th of March, so please join us this evening for an informal time of worship. All Zoom codes, details of what's on and a message from Moira can be found in GDS Weekly News. You can subscribe through the link at the bottom of this YouTube page. GDS Weekly News is also available in an audio version and you can call 0131 546 4485. Please share the number with friends who don't have internet access. Don't forget, summertime begins officially next weekend and it's time to move the clocks forward one hour for the 28th of March. Finally, I'd like to remind you of a message given last week. Prayer, love, service. Our vision statement taken from 1 Peter chapter 4. And we seek to demonstrate all three through our worship, our work with children, young people and their families, in Salt Yard, our church cafe and outreach centre, through Diadan, where we created a regular venue for homeless people until the COVID pandemic meant a different style of accommodation was needed. We're now exploring exciting opportunities for using Diadem's resources, perhaps in a new supportive role as the future becomes clearer. Although it's now one year since we had to discontinue weekly services in our sanctuary, we still have financial commitments to meet throughout the year as the work of the church continues and still needs your support. While we've been unable to worship regularly in person, our offerings have fallen significantly. And of course, we have lost income from hall lets. Our church family is a generous one. And perhaps it's been your custom to make a donation for church flowers to mark a special occasion or anniversary. Since there have been no opportunities to do this in the last 12 months, you may like to consider making a gift of that money to the church instead. Please give prayerful thought to whether you might be able to give an additional one-off donation at this time or possibly increase your regular offering. Details of how you can do this will be on the screen at the end of our service. We want to continue the work of God that he's given us to do and to put into action our vision of prayer, love, service in a spiritual, compassionate and practical way with and for those in our church family and the GDS community around us. Thank you for giving this situation your attention and prayers. And now Moira will lead us in worship. Good morning. Um, it's lovely of you to join us this morning on Sunday the 21st of March, the fifth Sunday in Lent. And I have before me our candles symbolising the six Sundays in Lent. And what we're doing is we're blowing one out for every week that passes. So today we need to blow out um, uh, five of our candles and we'll be left with only one. And this symbolises the darkening days as we um, proceed towards Good Friday and Jesus' sacrifice and death on the cross. But of course we know that he rises again on Easter Sunday and we celebrate with great joy. So let's blow out our candles. So five. And we're left with one, one burning candle. Let's settle our minds and open our hearts as we come before God in worship, our call to worship. 
Look upon us, O Lord, and let all the darkness of our souls vanish before the beams of your brightness. Fill us with holy love and open to us the treasures of your wisdom. All our desire is known to you. O perfect what you have begun and what your spirit has awakened us to ask. We seek your face. Turn your face unto us and show us your glory. Only then will our longing be satisfied and our peace shall be perfect. Amen. And now over to Norda with our first hymn. was a nun who lived in the 15th century. People visited her for help and advice and she shared with them her visions of God and her understanding of his love. And she said, Our Lord spoke these words with utter certainty. You will not be overcome. The words you will not be overcome were spoken firmly to give assurance and comfort against all the troubles which might come. He did not say, you will not be tempested, you will not be troubled, you will not be distressed. He said, you will not be overcome. Let's come together in prayer. God of all power and majesty, how wonderful to know that you care so much for each one of us, that you hear our every prayer that you choose to work through ordinary people like us. Lord God, it takes our breath away that you trust us to share your message of hope and salvation with all those around us. But Holy God, we know it's an impossible task if we try to do it only in our own strength. We are imperfect beings 
whose sins cause you pain, yet you love us despite our wrongdoing. Lord, help us to be honest and admit our mistakes. It's not always easy to own up and say, it was me, I was wrong, I shouldn't have done it. Sometimes we try to make things right by ourselves, but we only make things worse if we try to do it without your help, without fully recognising our sin before you. Help us, Lord, to show remorse, to see that we've broken your trust. And when we call on your mercy to wash away our sins, may we be confident that through the death of Jesus on the cross and his resurrection, we already have your forgiveness. Restore us to the people you want us to be, Lord. Take from us the darkness of our despair, our guilt, our shame. Renew our outlook and attitude to being in step with you once more as we remember your promise to us. You will not be overcome. May we feel good about ourselves as life gleams again with joyous bright colour as we bask in the warmth of your smile, as we glimpse afresh a little piece of heaven on earth. Let's gather all our prayers together as we share in saying the words Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory for ever. Amen. And now Gordon will bring us today's readings. Today's first reading is from Psalm 51, verses 1 to 12. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me, but restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Our second reading is from John's Gospel, chapter 12, verses 20 to 33. Jesus predicts his death. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am my servant also will be. My Father will honour the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it 
said it had thundered, while others said an angel had spoken to him. But Jesus said, This voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. Let's pray. God of boundless mercy and unfailing love, our creator, saviour and redeemer, as part of the body of Christ around the world, as people called to live for you in the families and communities and networks in which you have placed us. We gather together to worship you, to proclaim your goodness and to offer our thanks and praise. Meet us here, we pray. Join our hearts in wholehearted worship. Breathe your word into our souls. Engrave your covenant of grace into our, our minds and hearts. Cultivate your character in us. Inspire and shape us. Unite and encourage us. That our lives may reflect your love and justice to the world. Amen. Merciful God, have mercy on our souls according to your unwavering love, according to your abundant mercy. Wipe away our sins and the guilt we have carried for so long. Instead, write on our hearts your love, your boundaries for our lives, your salvation that sets us free from our sins to live the abundant life you have for each of us. Lord, we would see Jesus. Lord, we would love Jesus. We would follow Jesus. We would serve Jesus. Lord, Create in us clean hearts. Renew your spirit within us. Do not turn us away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation and sustain in us a willing spirit. Write on our hearts your love, O oh God. Amen. Let's say Psalm 117. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples. For great is his love towards us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness shall not overcome it. Good morning. It's the fifth Sunday in Lent. I still have a candle burning, but there are fewer and fewer as Lent in our journey continues. Today's readings take us to the very middle of Lent, the part where Jesus is getting ready for the next stage of his journey to the cross and beyond. The passages we've heard might seem quite gloomy and sad. They talk about judgment in John chapter 12. And it talks about sin and being clean in Psalm 51. That got me thinking, particularly this week, as some more of our children and young people have gone back to school, it got me thinking about some of the things that we see a lot in our lives at the moment. 
I think maybe I'm not the only one that is seeing more of these things in their house and pockets and bags at the moment. Our hand gel keeps us safe. We have to remember to use it. It might be that as well as washing our hands when we're preparing food and coming in from outside like we used to do anyway, that now we can be found whipping out something like this at all sorts of moments just to keep safe. It could be that when we come in from playing outside at school or play group that we wash our hands and have a squirt of this. When we're in the shops or the supermarket. Maybe if we bump into someone outside or we hold a door open, we want to clean our hands as well. That's about keeping our outsides clean. How about if we've been outside gardening and we've been potting up plants and the mud gets stuck right into our fingertips and into our nails. It might be that we've been out for a bike ride or we've been playing outside and having a lovely time in the mud or when it was snowy and we got all messy. It might need more than a bit of a scrub, so it could be that we'd go and have a good soak in the bath and soften up all that lovely mud and then we could get it really nice and clean. It could be that some of it was even more serious than that. If we haven't been paying attention, for instance, or if the mud really wasn't getting off, we might need a serious scrub to sort out the bits that aren't properly clean. It's a bit like our readings, isn't it? Now, I'm fairly sure that these bottles of hand wash don't have hyssop in, like the psalmist in Psalm 51 talked about. Cleanse me with hyssop so that I can be whiter than snow. Make it right with me, God, is what he said. Then later on in John chapter 12, Jesus talks about judgment, about things that have gone wrong. Things go wrong in our life and maybe Lent is the time that we can think about cleaning up our act, sorting ourselves out, getting ready for the cross and Easter when we get feel closer than ever to God. It could be that when we come in from playtime and we're washing our hands, that we maybe remember that we haven't played as kindly with our friends as we could have done. It could be that we have spent more time watching our favourite TV show than it was getting down to our work or our homework. It could be this niggling doubt that I was meant to call that person last week and I still haven't checked on them. It could be something that's been around a lot longer and we need to have a think about it. That soak in the bath. It might be something that's been nagging away at us for a while. It could be something that often gets in the way of us and God. Worse than that, it could be something that takes an awful lot of scrubbing. Something big, something long-standing that's got in the real way of us being in a good place with God. Good news is that Jesus has gone before us. In John 12, he knew he was going to have to do a terrible hard thing. But he did it. And he did it so that no matter how hard or difficult the tasks are that we have to do, he has gone before us. So whatever we do, nothing is going to separate us from God's love because of what Jesus did on the cross. He knew it was coming and he didn't waver. So that means whatever things there are in our lives that are getting between us and God, whether it's things that we can maybe fix with the, a squirt of hand sanitizer or needs a bigger, deeper look, Jesus has gone before us and he's actually right beside us too. So this week in Lent, maybe it's time to take a good look at what we can change, what we can do better, what we can do, what we can clean up to make us, like the psalmist says, whiter than snow, that we can be great friends with God, with nothing in between us. Have a good week. Thank you, Bettina. Today, we're going to think about what to do when we get things wrong. When we make bad choices or mistakes or just deliberately follow the wrong path. As adults, I think we're confronted less about our behaviours and attitudes than children are. As a parent, I seem to be frequently engaged 
in the job of guiding my children through the rights and wrongs of relationships and behaviour. And children have a highly developed sense of justice. What's right? What's wrong? Even though it's not always fairly applied to themselves. Like in these instances. How did the marker get on your face? Um... Who put it on your face? Um, Daddy. Daddy put it on your face? Yeah, Daddy. And who put the toothpaste on your face? Daddy. Oh, Daddy did that too. I think it was you. Daddy. No, who drew on Mammy's mirror? I don't know. Was it you? No. Who was it? It's Batman. <laughs> it's Batman. Batman did it. Did you eat hot chocolate? Can you tell me lies? What's on your face? What's on your face? Um, uh, sauce. What sort of sauce? Um, How do I park it What? How do I park it Michael, you broke my iPod. John, what are you eating? You didn't eat anything. John, can you explain to me why, why the sprinkles are empty? Did you eat those sprinkles? No. I did not. Yeah, sprinkles. John, hmm? you have sprinkles on your face. When I was preparing for today's message, I was thinking about all the aspects of how we deal with bad attitudes and behaviours in ourselves and in others. Sometimes there are things we are happy to confess and repent of because they're things that we think are more socially acceptable sins, so to speak. But other things, the real grubby, mean-spirited or cruel stuff, we keep well hidden. Or we carry guilt and shame that's not ours to carry. We believe lies about ourselves, that we are rubbish or bad or no good, instead of accepting God at his word that we are his children, without, with whom he is very pleased. The thing is, if we think we're hiding anything from God, we're deluded. In the same way that these kids tried to hide what they'd done from their parents, to put the blame elsewhere, we have no chance of fooling God. We might as well be saying, Batman did it. One of the first times I really thought about confession was when I read the book Angela's Ashes, which is the story of a young lad, Frank McCourt, growing up in Limerick, Ireland. I'm going to read the story of his First Communion, which shows how complicated the notion of sin can get. This is Frank's second confession, not long after he's taken his First Communion. And he's there because he ate so much rich food that he was sick and his granny is really worried. Now I apologise in advance for the accent. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It's a day since my last confession. A day? What sins have you committed in a day, my child? I overslept. I nearly missed my first communion. My grandmother says I have standing up North of Ireland Presbyterian hair. I threw up my first communion breakfast. Now grandma says she has God in her backyard and what should she do? Uh, tell your grandmother to wash God away with a little water. And for your penance say one Hail Mary and one Our Father. Say a prayer for me and God bless you, my child. Grandma and Mam were waiting close to the confession box. Grandma says, 
Were you telling jokes to that priest in the confession box? If tis a thing I ever found out you were telling jokes to Jesuits, I'll tear the kidneys out of you. Now, what did he say about God in me backyard? He said, wash him away with a little water, Grandma. Holy water or ordinary water? He didn't say, Grandma. Well, go back and ask him. But Grandma, she pushed me back into the confessional. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It's a minute since my last confession. A minute! Are you the boy that was just here? I am, Father. What is it now? My grandma says, holy water or ordinary water. Ordinary water, and tell your grandmother not to be bothering me again. I told her, ordinary water, grandma, and he said, don't be bothering him again. Don't be bothering him again, that ignorant bog trotter. Many of us can identify with the way we get so caught up with certain types of sins that we ignore many of the nitpicky, corrosive, non-compassionate behaviours that Jesus shines a light on so often in his ministry. There is no hierarchy of sin. Whether we indulge in malicious gossip or commit murder, we are to accept our wrong and ask forgiveness for it. When I read Psalm 51, written by David after his sin with Bathsheba, I realise that we often treat repentance as a statement, and I'm sorry, please forgive me, that checks a box and hopefully alleviates our guilt. But if we look closely at Psalm 51, we see that repentance is a turning away from sin and a turning towards God. A process that doesn't merely alleviate guilt, but cultivates deep joy. And that's not the only payoff. Repenting and receiving forgiveness from God leads to real relationships with others because it leaves us with nothing left to hide. So how do we go about growing in a joy-giving habit of repentance? Rule one, define the sin. The first step to meaningful confession is understanding what sin is. David uses three different words for it in Psalm 51, iniquity, sin and transgression. Each term has been deliberately chosen for its unique meaning in Hebrew. Transgressions implies a rebellion against God's authority and law. Iniquity means a, a distortion of what should be and sin is a missing of the mark. David is making it clear that his sin, sin is deep. There's no minimising or excusing it. Rule two, appeal to God's mercy. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. Here, David appeals for forgiveness based on what he knows about God's character that God is merciful. David knows that God is committed to him in a relationship or covenant of unfailing love. And when we come before God in repentance, we do so on the basis of his covenant with us through Christ. Rule three, avoid defensiveness and see God rightly. David's sin hurt multiple people. He committed adultery, orchestrated a murder and tried to cover it all up. And yet he says to God that against you, you only have I sinned. How can that be? Well, if we think of sin as failing to hit the mark, then we have to ask, whose mark are we missing? The answer, of course, is that it's God's mark. So although our sin does hurt others and repenting to those people is important, 
Sin is ultimately against God, since it's his ways that we have failed to live up to and his image bearers whom we hurt. Rule four, look to Jesus. David's reference to hyssop in verse seven is not accidental. Cleanse me with hyssop and I shall be clean. He knows that hyssop signifies purification with blood and he knows that blood alone can make him whiter than snow. But what he doesn't know is how this will be done fully. But we do. Instead of relying on an animal sacrifice, we look to Jesus, whose blood is enough to make us whiter than so snow, who has appeared once and for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Rule 5. Ask God to break you and heal you. David prays, let the bones you have crushed rejoice. When God reveals our sin to us, it's painful. David was already a sin-broken man. He just didn't fully realise it until God sent the prophet Nathan to show him his sin and break him all the way. Like a doctor resetting a fractured bone, it's God who breaks, God who sets and God who heals. And this is all mercy. The 19th century British pastor Charles Spurgeon wrote that seeing our weakness and experiencing God's power to save teaches us a heart music which only broken bones can learn. Rule six, be comforted by the Spirit. Next, David prays, do not take your Holy Spirit from me. But the very fact that David is grieved over his sin is a sign that God's Spirit is at work in him. And this is true for you as well. Have you ever been so discouraged by your sin that you've wondered, how can God possibly love me? Surely I'm not really a Christian. Take comfort in knowing that the very grief you're experiencing is a sign that you have the Spirit of God working in you, causing you to hate what God hates. Rule 7. Rejoice and proclaim the truth. In verses 12 to 15, David's asking God to make him so joyful about his salvation that he can't help but teach other sinners the forgiving ways of God. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. This is important because so often we do the opposite. We're inclined to wallow in our sin and draw back from serving others, whether in church or in our communities, because we think we're unworthy. But here, David says the joy of forgiveness for sin should compel us to speak of that good news with friends, family, co-workers and neighbours. And finally, rule eight, resolve to obey. We can check all the boxes, do all the steps above and say all the right words. But if in the back of our minds we're planning to sin in the same way again, then grace isn't really, truly taking root. What God desires is the mark of true repentance. A heart that is broken by sin and truly contrite. As Puritan pastor and writer Thomas Watson wrote, Till sin be bitter, Christ will not be sweet. If we come to God with a heart like that, he will not despise it. He'll accept it and accept us because of Christ's sacrifice on our behalf. So what about you today? What sins are weighing on your heart? What guilt have you been trying to cover over with distraction? Or are you submerging yourself under the weight of it as a form of penance, 
rather than taking your sin to the cross, where it's already been paid for. Jesus said in our Gospel reading today, My light will shine for you just a little longer. Walk in the light while you can, so the darkness will not overtake you. Those who walk in the darkness cannot see where they are going. Put your trust in the light while there is still time. Then you will become children of the light. You will become children of the light. It takes some of us to hit rock bottom before we can walk into the light, whereas others can see it more readily and accept it more easily. But the forgiveness and reconciliation to perfect love is there for the taking by anyone who chooses to believe, repent, lay down guilt and shame and rejoice in the incomparable grace offered through Christ's sacrifice. Amen. Now let's join together in our prayers for others. Let's pray. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your loving kindness. In your great compassion, hear our prayers. We pray for the whole church, all the people of God, all who respond to the call of Jesus, follow me. Wash us through and through and cleanse us from our sin. We pray for our nation, for all the nations of the earth and for all who govern and judge. Purge us from our sin and we shall be pure. We pray for those who hunger, those who thirst, those who cry out for justice, those who live under the threat of terror, and those without a place to lay their head. May they hear of joy and gladness, that those who are broken may rejoice, we pray for those who are ill, those in pain, those under stress, and those who are lonely. Give them the joy of your saving help and sustain them with your bountiful spirit. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. We pray for those who have been bereaved. Give them your comfort and peace. Lord Jesus, you taught your disciples that unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. As we prepare our hearts to remember your death and resurrection, Grant us the strength and wisdom to serve and follow you this day and always. Amen. And now we go over to Norda for our final hymn.
thank you for joining us for worship this morning. I pray that you have a good week and that you feel God's presence within you and all around you. And now our blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you Hello. We're passing through a global storm which has no precedent for us with the COVID-19 virus, the coronavirus as it's known. It's affecting every nation and individual across the entire world. So it is that we're not even able to meet together for worship, Bible study or prayer for the foreseeable future. This is why I'm speaking to you by this video broadcast, to bring you a short message of encouragement from all your friends at GDS Church, so that you know that you are not forgotten, nor are you alone, and that there is hope for the future.